<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I have the pleasure of presenting uh, Professor Carlos Paternino, a great friend, colleague, and mentor. I have been working with Carlos for the last 20 something years when he arrived from Mississippi to the beaches of the University of Norte. And then I was a student, and I did the master with Carlos, and I taught classes with Carlos, and then we have been collaborating for many years. He's now a faculty at San Diego State University in the business school, doing analytics, information systems, software, and is an expert in heuristics, large scale modeling, optimization, and have been uh, analyzing real problems and solving real uh, world problems and applying them at the private sector and the public sector in Colombia and other locations. So, again, Carlos, thank you for coming. And we are all yours. Thank you. So yeah, it's uh, over 20 years now, working kind of uh, together, publishing and researching uh, with Miguel since he was uh, an undergraduate student. So thank you for having me here. Uh, first of all, uh, this is my second time to use you. First time was, I don't remember, like eight years ago or something. I was still in Colombia at the time. Uh, I've been in San Diego State University for a year now. I'm a faculty member of the College of Business. Uh, some reason supply chain management here in the United States is more towards the uh, business school side and not, there are not many engineering schools that do that. Uh, <clears throat> so well, it was like a good move in my case. Um, and I'll explain later that. Uh, Miguel said part of it, I, I do apply for it. So, so when you go to businesses and you apply, you research with them, uh, then it makes sense that uh, your information systems part of uh, the work uh, goes more towards the business school so, uh, because I'm solving business problems most of the time. Now, I'm, there are two concerns that you do when you consult and research. The first one is what the customer wants. And then, yes, you're hired to do a job. Uh, in my case, most of the time, I'm hired to do optimization. So that means efficiency, productivity, et cetera. Uh, but there's another side of it, which is how do we model that and how we use the data to do something else. And that's uh, part of what I'm going to show you today is related to those two sides of uh, the work. So my, my work or my talk today will be on a topic called smart ports. And smart ports are, uh, the, the topic is being kind of confused. Smart ports are more sustainable. So sustainability in the three senses, profit, people, and planet is what we are researching uh, together. So crew management is part of it. Uh, management social responsibility is part of it. Managing environmental uh, emissions is a big deal of what I'm doing these days. Uh, and of course, optimizing the port operations. So um, I'm gonna start with this. Uh, maritime industry has gone digital. Uh, for a long time, it's now been that way. I was just discussing with some of the students outside that uh, one of the reasons why we don't fully go uh, into automation is because there's still a human part of it to the problem. So many, in many places in the world, uh, we can see Singapore, uh, some of the ports in China, uh, rather than fully automated, completely automated. And then with very little people, and they're the, more product the most productive, highly productive ports in the world. Uh, and then you come to the U.S. and only two ports have information systems that do visibility at the full scale. Uh, those are the ports of L.A. and the ports of Louisiana. And not many of them do optimization in their operations. And not many of them do automation in their, in their operations. And some of the reasons is because there's a human part. Of it. So there are negotiations in which humans, I mean, uh, the unions want to, uh, you know, not go that far into automation. Uh, which is kind of a deal, and we have to work around it. We have to do the modeling based on that problematic. So uh, I'm going to show you problems which are from ports uh, aside of uh, the U.S., outside of the U.S. Uh, so from I, I worked in Colombia for 27 years before coming back to the U.S. last year. So the data that I have is for two ports. One is a general cargo port, and that's where I did the environmental part of it. And the other uh, port is the port of Cartagena, which is a fully automated, a, a fully optimizable port. Uh, it's been working with information systems for port, specific port operations for over 20 years. So, and it, it ranks 13 in the world for uh, uh, productivity. So, so it was good to have the data to work with them. Uh, together. So, 
We say that the maritime industry grows has gone digital uh, because many of the things that we can do today, uh, like for instance, the manifestos, the cargo manifests uh, now, the bill of ladings, they are automated, they are electronic, and sometimes they're even encrypted. So blockchain is a big part of that section of management, the cargo interaction at the management level. Uh, that's one, one big growth. But we can have three, digi three different types of uh, digitalization issues in the maritime industry. And you can go from supply chains, uh, in which ports are like a big link for any supply chain. So anything that happens in the port will affect us. So if the port gets congested, then we don't get uh, our products at home. If the port gets a strike, then uh, we're gonna need to, to find our products somewhere else, from somewhere else. And land transportation is a lot more expensive than uh, maritime transportation. So uh, nonetheless, um, so you digitize the supply chain and then you have uh, many of the visibility of supply chain now available. We are in the verge of going to what we call the interconnectivity highway in the West Coast ports. So that means that all the ports are going to be connected uh, and they're going to be connected with the trucking industry. That means that they will have visibility of the trucks and they can balance or uh, allow uh, to, to have less imbalances in freight uh, because now they know where the, where the, where the drivers are and they, they can you know, geofence their operations and do some things up more, more efficiently. The second part of it is the digital port. And that's what I'm going to focus on right now. Not on the supply chain part of it, I'm gonna focus on the port. Uh, and I will talk about that in a minute. And the third one is the digital ship. So shipping lines are going more efficient uh, in terms of uh, fuel, more efficient in terms of, in terms of size. But uh, when you get bigger ships, you need bigger equipment to handle that. And then you, you most likely would <clears throat> Are able to see that when a large 20, 22,000 containers, TEU containers come to a port, you're going to be utilizing seven ADOCs, uh, berths, uh, berth positions that we call it, uh, from the port at that time, which means you will not be attending or serving smaller ships at that same time, because that big ship will be uh, using seven to eight quay cranes and seven to eight berthing positions. So balancing that operation with the operation of the rest of the feeder uh, type of vessels and with the smaller vessels uh, is one thing that we have to do. So everything now goes to the cloud. Everything now uh, goes through interconnect interconnectivity and everything now goes to analytics. So the great deal that we do is, what do we do with the data? data. Many of the companies that I have consulted before uh, for they have a tons of data and they had it stored and they did nothing with it. So that the first reason to have data is because you wanna learn something from the data. And that's one thing that we can do now. So the type of uh, management that we are able to analyze now and uh, the data management that we are able to analyze now is uh, tons of magnitudes hit higher than we used to have uh, 20 years ago. I was talking to some students, my first paper on ready for from learning, which is a machine learning technique came in 20, 2000, 2002, I believe. Uh, and 20 years later, and there's people, a lot of people now writing in Rayport for Learning. Uh, the things that we do today are way different than the things that I did 20 years ago, but they're still the same concepts underlying. Okay? So, why do we use this digitalization? Well, you have greater flexibility because, for one reason, I'm going to prove to you that when you, up, when you automate, when you uh, digitalize, and when you op optimize, you get space free. That means you get new commercial opportunities. So for, from the point, point of view of managing the port, having optimized the operations will give you more time, more flexibility to be able to accept new service lines. And each new service lines, which will mean a lot of money for the port as well. So productivity actually in that sense, being seen as efficiency, economical efficiency is good for the ports, is good for the management of the port, uh, but it's not the only one. You get better integration, you get more transparency. Everything is visible now, uh, except when you encrypt. When you encrypt things, well, then there's a reason for encrypt, encrypt things, okay? Uh, but you get transparency and visibility with, the, with those tools. Okay, and I am going to focus on these two at the end. You get reduced response time and you get lower environmental impacts. Uh, and that's the two parts of the talk up today that I will do. So in order for us to be 
for to work on smart ports, we need to rely on smart uh, information systems. There's no way you can do this hand. Uh, uh, doing, don't, uh, you cannot do this by hand. You need an information system to put things together, to connect, to tie, to process the data, to prepare it, to mine the data. You need information systems. Okay. So just to give you a heads up of uh, what is, what the, how has been the evolution of this concept. Uh, this is part of a paper that I published in 2020 in Transportation Research Part A, and it was uh, around the evolution of core community systems, which are the information systems that give visibility. To the that means that they have everything together in that platform from the manifests, the cargo manifests, from the digital uh, platforms that the, the vessels have to the possibility of connecting with freight brokering systems to the possibility to uh, uh, automate in the use of port equipment, such as rich stackers or any, anything that uh, handles materials. There. there were 48 PCS software uh, implementations in the world in 2020 at the time. So I might think that there might be 50 plus now. And the deal that we have now is that we're introducing machine intelligence to make decisions or help us make decisions in a more intelligent way. Now, what we look for in a smart port platform, we look for management and training. We look for energy and environmental issues. That means we want energy consumption to be efficient uh, when we manage things automate, automated. Uh, we want security and safety. Uh, if you have everything connected, there's a very little, I mean, cargo contamination is always an issue. Any port in the world has it. There are ports that have more problems with those. But whenever you're able to visualize and trace every single bit of operation that you have in the port, then it makes it more difficult for them to do that contamination of curve. Okay. Customs and collection is one of the big deals that PCS has worked for. Uh, in the assignment and synchronizing of intermodal traffic, it's a big deal with PCS. And many of the ports that we have in the West Coast have direct connections, not just with the, with the interlap with the land uh, carriers, but also with uh, railroads. So that uh, synchronization and optimization of when to schedule departures and arrivals and things, that's also of the most important. Uh, cargo handling and infrastructure. Uh, so just to give you a brief of the literature to where we are right now, there is not a formal unified definition on the term smart ports. So there's people that talk about smart ports because ports have to become greener, more environmentally friendly, more sustainable. There are people that think that smart ports are just information systems that work uh, everything on a the software. There is people that talk about all the IoT interconnectivity. So that means sense of fusion. That's another issue of technology. So we wanted to, and this is something that we're still on the work on, working on. Uh, we wanted to, first of all, pile up a name, uh, a definition, a description of what the term is. And we came up with this. So, uh, and when I write network networks, I'm gonna explain that at the end because that's a project that we have submitted uh, very recently to NSF. Uh, we describe smart ports as interconnected and automated holistic systems that are able to ensure efficiency and competitiveness in all their areas through the adoption of intelligent technology while facilitating collaboration between their stakeholders. Now, all the areas involve all the areas, including people, profit, and planet. So those are the main deals that we want to work in. And this is a framework that we have done. So when we talk about port management, you need to understand that there are three platforms that you have to look for. You have to look for performance. And that's the first part of it, which is the optimization framework that we built for it. Uh, you need to talk about the port environmental plan, and you need to talk about the port social impact. So from each one of those, you are going to find tons of problems to research on. Tons. I mean, literally a lot of uh, problems that you can research on. From the port performance, I'm going to go down a bit. I'm going to stand here. You can do C to hinterland, C to port and port to hinterland connection. And there is a lot of scheduling, a lot of planning, tactical operation of an individual strategic problems that you can solve uh, on that scale. At the port terminal level, and I'm gonna explain a little bit more there. You have quay crane scheduling, you have a uh, vert uh, scheduling, you have yard management, terminal plan, you have uh, crew plan and scheduling, you have vessel management. So the famous port congestion problem that we had at the beginning, at the end of the last year and beginning of this year, uh, 
which by the way, there was not one only cause of that congestion. There were many things that caused that congestion. Uh, there is, that is part of the problem that you can study. If you optimize the operation, then you can help with the congestion. Uh, they implemented, and I was following their implementation. I, I, I didn't do it, but I was following the implementation of queuing models for managing vessel traffic at the ports of LA and Long Beach, which was kind of neat. Uh, they, they don't have congestion now, but now they don't, they're not moving 1 million TUs per month. They're moving 600 and something thousand containers per month. So that means that the congestion problems have been released a little bit, but just because, not only because they work on congestion management, but because also the level of cargo was decreased uh, from the million TUs that we had from, uh, per month uh, in those months to the 600 and plus thousand containers that we now have at those two ports, which are the biggest ports in the US. So uh, then intermodal transport. And there's the analytics part of it. So from the analytical part of it, we can map vessels, we can map trucks, we can uh, follow and trace and track operations from the sea, from the land, and from the port equipment. So I can analyze the behavior of my equipment for handling uh, at the quake crane level or at the yard stockers, uh, the ridge stockers, or the electric equipment for the reefer containers. I can manage that information. I have data for that. And with data, we can do a lot of things. So one of the things that we're doing, and it's our interest, is we're monitoring map and mapping air quality. Now, there are many words in the concept of port emissions inventory. There are very few works on predicting those port emissions inventories. But one such uh, work just recently was uh, released by Stefan Boss, one of our network um, uh, partners. Uh, uh, and it was on the port of Hamburg. And the reason for predicting is because if you are able to predict, you're able to control before it happens. If I know what are the vessels that are coming, and I say mapping vessels, is because I can have their automated identification systems work for me. I can know their location, I can know their speed, I can know their acceleration, I can know many things from the motors. And with that information, I can understand the emissions behavior. And with understanding, that means I can build a machine learning uh, algorithm that works and maps that uh, all those variables, which I'm going to show which ones we're using, uh, and it will give you a model. And the model will give you in time, hour by hour, a definition of what would be the emission that you could expect once the vessel arrives to the port. That's uh, interesting to know because if you know that you're above to cross the threshold for regulations from which you start paying penalties, you can, you can do many things. One of the things is you can stop the operation. Now, I don't want to tell you how much it costs to halt one hour of operation in the Port of Valley. It's millions of dollars, okay? So you don't want to halt operations. You want to be intelligently managing operations. So what you do with that information is instead of halting the operation, you can sequence the vessels, to give more space for those that will allow you to decrease the level of emissions at that time. And then the optimization changes the objective function. From a purely productivity-based objective function, you now are constrained to not cross thresholds of environmental issues. And then your sequence will give you, or the new sequence will give you an opportunity of not losing that much productivity, but keeping in track the emissions that you do. That's basically uh, one of the things that we're doing. So, uh, that's the framework that, uh, uh, that uh, we're proposing that, that I'm using at the moment. And the experimental plan that we have is, uh, you know, as any design experiments that you have done before. So I'm not going to go that deep into this. Uh, unless somebody at the end wants to talk about it, I can come back. So just a graphical description of what we're doing. Uh, our concept is smart ports. I'm not talking. Uh, we're not understanding the problem of governance uh, because that depends on where you are located in the world. So for instance, the ports in the US are, we do have port authorities and those port authorities typically are landlords. That means you're leasing the space to terminals and the terminals are the ones that operate the port activities. If that happens, you can only work efficiency with the terminals, not with the port. Authority, I mean. 
but you can work environmental issues with the port authority, not with the terminals, because the ones that are responsible for managing the environment are the port authorities. So that's how it works here in the US. If you go to Latin America, from Mexico downwards, you're going to find that the port operation is done by the same port authority. And sometimes you don't even have a port authority. So in a country such as ours in Colombia, we don't have port authorities. We have port concessions. And those concessions are public-private enterprises uh, or partnerships that come from 20, 30 years ago. And they know, not only are responsible for giving them the government the royalties that they're supposed to give, but also for efficiently managing the operations of the port. So they control all the operations. If you go to Europe, they have public-private partnerships. The port of Hamburg is half operated, sorry, half owned by the city of Hamburg. And then the rest is owned by private corporations. So you get best, the, the best of both worlds right there. You get regulations from one side, you get social issues from one side, and you get the efficiency and productivity issues from the other side. Okay, so depending on the place on the world that you are, the framework that we will be using is different. Yeah, and it has to be used differently. Segmented uh, or jointly, but it has to be used differently. So what we're doing is we're basically intertwining a machine learning brain with an optimization large scale model with an information system. So this is the glue that we automate, which, which, with which we automate the whole process. We're able to build a fully described uh, model for categorizing vessels and bringing uh, port equipment, bringing uh, trucking companies, uh, connecting to freight brokering systems, connecting to all of the things through our information system, uh, in which underneath you're going to have a mathematical framework. Uh, I will talk about that later, but you are going to have a, an optimization brain underneath. But now it is connected to a machine learning brain, which will allow me to sometimes do self-evolution of the equations that I have, that I have built before self-tuning or fine-tuning of the optimization models that I'm building, or just predicting uh, things for me, predicting at the demand level or predicting the environmental issues or predicting attrition from the people side of it. And that's a big deal nowadays. So you have all heard about the word or the phrase uh, great resignation, right? So there is a way, I mean, there's that's something that's happening. I don't know if it's still gonna be the same when we hit scare of recession or something like that, but still people want to have the freedom to resign whenever they want. You can predict at a great scale, not at the mine, micro scale, you can predict the moment at which attrition is going to occur. So with prediction comes better planning. If you can predict the moment in which you're going to have people leaving your company, then you can allocate budget efficiently to train new people, to hire new people, and to put people to be productive at the time when it's needed. That doesn't mean that people will know when I'm retired. That means that there is a chance that the climate conditions, the, uh, work, work, the work environment, uh, there is a chance that based on the time that you have spent in the same role, based on the time that you now spend to give reports back to whomever needs it, if you, at the beginning of your work, were giving back reports in 20 minutes, and now you're taking 40 minutes to do so, it's because you're bored sometimes. It's because you're not you know, entangled or interested in doing the same thing uh, as you were before. So that means that you can predict the moment in which the company can or must do something to avoid boring, or it can predict the moment in which it has to allocate money or funding for uh, building a new pipeline of uh, workforce uh, for, for the industry. So that's one, uh, that's the social factor that we're talking about. Um, environmental, we did say in mobility, what we're doing is that we're allowing interconnectivity from the information system to the freight brokering systems that work with the ports. So that means that you can connect to carriers and you can understand geographically and geospatially where the truckers are and what, what they are doing, when they are estimated to arrive, when the trucks are going to be within your geofence. And that's uh, the ARC, uh, the, the geographical information systems part of it that we can build into uh, the operations of the, of the port. So some promising fields from applications of machine learning come 
in, at many different levels. I'm going to try to explain uh, in three slides what the main promising fields are. At the moment, there are many things that could be discovered later, but at the moment, we can optimize traffic import at the land side or within premises or at the sea side. So optimization in our case is one of the deals that uh, have to be taken care of. So we can determine peak times of operation. We can determine how to avoid congestions based on the gate appointment systems that we build. We can build a gate appointment system now based on where the trucks are. So if I have visibility of the trucks, because I am now connected to the freight brokering systems, I can map the moment at, the, at which they are called to the port and I can give them a sequence in the queue so that I can optimize many things, whatever. I can optimize the time to stay within the system. I can optimize the emissions that the trucks are given. If I have electric equipment, if I have um, uh, diesel equipment, if I have motors of more than five years old or motors which are brand new, the emission levels are different. So I can measure those and I, am, I can understand uh, how they will affect the pollution at the port. Uh, a second set of promising avenues for maritime logistics import is uh, what we call regional provision of empty containers. Transporting air is one of the most expensive things that are. Uh, I, I mean, who wants to transport air? That means an empty container. So, but still, you have to bring containers back somehow. Containers belong to the shipping lines. They don't belong to the companies inland. They belong to the shipping lines. Uh, so that's the typical issue that we have to deal with. So yes, when you hire a company to bring you your cargo to your location in Indiana or in whatever, you still have to take, give that container back or that container is going to be you know, allocated to the lots of empty containers that go to the architectural design in containers. Uh, they're using architect, they're using containers for building houses now. So, so and offices, field offices. We can also use ML to detect damaged containers by the use of optics, by the use of x-rays, by the use of many of the hardcore technologies that we can apply uh, to uh, measure. If, for instance, there's a leak in, a, in an ISO container, it's easy to see that in an in infrared uh, type of camera because you will notice if there is a leak from the tank in a more easy way, okay? So if you use technology that is slash IOT sensors to give you information on how the containers are arriving to the port back from the customers or how are you giving the containers, then uh, there's a good chance that you can uh, manage to find, detect it and detect more easily damaged uh, containers uh, each time. And one, Big one that we're using is uh, working on the emissions part of it. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit more. I'm using a graph from CTL Hamburg. Oh, so the graph is not mine. I'm using a graph uh, from CTL Hamburg uh, in the paper is cited. So, um, but I'm also using some information that could give you a hint on how important is this for uh, the environment. So at the largest port in the world, which is the Shanghai port, the three major air pollutants, SO2, NOx, and PM2.5, constitute a significant proportion of the emissions, 12.4, 11.6, and 5.6 at 2014. That was Shanghai. Now, Shanghai is a C, I mean, it's, they have gained uh, ground and land to the sea. So they have tried to build, like Rotterdam did with MassLab 2. So they built the port outside. That actually helps into the emissions not reaching the city that much. Think about Hamburg. Let's not go outside the US. Think about Savannah in Georgia. Think about the ports inland. The operations at ports actually give a lot of emissions. So in a city like Hamburg, which is 42 or something kilometers, 28 miles inside the land, inside the Elba River, uh, LB or Elba, I forgot the exact name. Um, you're going to find that the port actually is in the middle of the city. So emissions at the port will go all the way to the city. So they will focus and concentrate a lot more than what you can see here. In our ports, we have a large marine layer 
that comes from the Pacific with a lot of wind. So the ports in our cities, LA, Long Beach, and uh, San Diego has a small port, but uh, uh, Oakland, you are going to notice that many of the emissions are going to come inside land just because the wind direction is bringing them down. Uh, but in, this, in, in addition to that, that means that uh, the city is the one that's going to feel more of those emissions, not just the port. Emissions at port will leave the port rapidly, but they will come to cities. So this is of our highest interest, to be able to manage different types of data, dynamic data from vessel position, course and speed, location and movement of traps, current tasks, scheduled arrivals, static data such as speed, fuel consumption, terminal capacity equipment, environmental data such as weather conditions, water level, traffic volumes, to be able to feed into a regressor or a classifier. In our case, it's a regressor. We're using a, an auto ML tipo uh, uh, algorithm to learn regression equations on to how to map the variables from vessels and from the many data that we can get a, a hold on towards 2.5 SO2 or uh, PM2, PM10, PM2.5, et cetera, all the, the, the pollutants that, that you can find. Oh, so there's a last paper by Stefan Voss and some of his students uh, that works exactly, uh, we're working at, around the same issues. Now, the data that I'm handling is different to their data, but it's exactly the kind, same kind of work. And what we do is, yes, we do have this brain here. So this is what we're building, uh, automated learning models. But uh, we're comparing different modeling uh, tools. So we use artificial neural networks. We use uh, uh, typical nonlinear and linear regressions uh, models. We use uh, random uh, forestries. We use many tools to prove different qualities uh, with the data that we were given. And at the very end, we found out that the AltoML tipo progressor was giving us a high level of prediction capability without having to generalize. I was using only 60% of the total data to learn the capabilities, uh, uh, to learn the equations that the people uh, was able to find at over 99% sometimes. Uh, now, I'm one of those people that if I find a 90, 99 point something percent of predictive capability, I don't like to use that model uh, because I, I need to give space for error. I need to get, give space for more unpredictable things that could happen. So more data that I'm not seeing. So I want to be able to generalize more. So uh, we, uh, although we had a, a whole bunch of uh, very good results, at the end, we ended up working with uh, the one that was not at 99%, but other that was around 92, 93% of capability of prediction. And it were better when I fed new data. So, so the, the cross capabilities of uh, the learning model are a lot better than the predict that the already existing ports emissions inventory frameworks uh, using equations with many assumptions. The things with this thing is that you don't need to assume anything at all. Just let them learn. That's what, that's what you do. And it's a lot more easier in that case. When you do specific mathematical modeling of ports emissions, there's a lot of assumptions that, that, that you have to make. So what we're using to do that. So this is the kind of data that we fit into the networks. So we have the type of motor ship, the type of load, the date on which ship dropped to the port, the docking time, then which ship sailed from the port. Many things, engine speed, EM fuel, A fuel, engine speed, power, all of those variables were fed into the network. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the inner layers of the neural net had over 250,000 nodes. I don't remember the exact number right now. Uh, but that means that the, because we have a large number of input variables, and that is on a time basis, so that means that it's going to have, uh, you have to measure that on times. Uh, that means you have more inputs. Uh, it, you're going to have a lot more inner network nodes that, uh, uh, so that you make a valid neural network. Okay? Same with the regressor using AutoML. Uh, what else? Okay, so that was the emissions part of it. Why do you want to measure emissions? Yes, you want to be sustainable. You want to be more friendly with the environment, but you also want to help the productivity of the core not to be affected by that. So that's the second part of it. We're going to move into productivity, and then I'm going to give uh, open questions for 
uh, future research that we have uh, on this same topic. So on the integrated optimization framework, we wanted to go, this was a real case study. So this was not uh, just let's go use the data that uh, Maisel and the other authors have uh, published widely. And then people do bird scheduling with that data. People do weight crane scheduling with that beta, data. Uh, people do some sort of integration before, be, between BERT and quake crane scheduling. No, we wanted, uh, I mean, we were hired to do a job. Uh, so we had real data uh, at the time. So our framework actually works towards the full continuum of optimization in the port. So uh, the only thing that we were not able to do at this time was the connection to the geofencing of the trucking uh, carriers. We were able to do or and optimize only until the gate appointment systems. That was it. But then I did gate appointment systems with the trucks that were already telling me that we're arriving. That means I have an estimated time of arrival given by the trucker, not given by my information system. On the remaining parts of it, we were able to have all the information within the information system. So we developed a library of multiple, multiple smart models for the optimization of ports, uh, independently engaged in parallel, but mathematically coordinated. So there is a brain that makes everything be glued together, okay? And the challenge was, this is what the port wanted us to do. You have to implement tactical planning at the port and scheduling models to optimize operations and commercial services for a container outboard. And the most relevant pain points to analyze for the improvement of operational efficiency there include, but are not limited to, by the way, Time of vessel that the bird needs to be minimized because the more, the faster you can make a bird uh, being free, the faster you can make it operate again. So imports and container hot ports, that's very important. One scarcity does not allow container terminals to meet the rapid growth of freight traffic. Uh, the ports, if you notice how, where the ports are located, they're surrounded by cities. So land is actually scarce. You don't have, unlimited availability of land to make port operations or make storage management of storage uh, within the port. So you have to be efficient in managing the yard as well. The overall congestion increases operation variability and reduces throughput. This is true for any supply chain problem, okay? not just for ports. Operations on the different subsystems need to be effectively coordinated. I, I had two terminals. Each terminal had 10, 15 bird positions. Uh, 15 cranes. There are vessels that come with their own crane as well. So you have to efficiently and effectively coordinate the use of those terminals. The less transfer you make between one terminal to the other was, is very important. And the logistics of container terminals has reached a high degree of complexity. There's a lot of things that now go underneath those ports, especially when you want to automate. Uh, then again, uh, oh, I brought this back. Okay, this is a service. Just to understand uh, what a service means in the port operation is a frequency of a shipping service. So this is how it's built. So this frequency actually runs every 14 days. This is a fortnightly service uh, or bi-weekly service. That means every 14 days, the ship comes back to the port and it does always the same uh, route. This is not handled by the port, this is handled by the shipping line. So we have no control on this, okay? We have control on what happens in the time window that the vessel comes to the port. That's where we have control, but we don't have control of the routes because that is optimization done at the shipping line, not at the ports, okay? Types of data that we get, we have data for resources. I'm just, I'm just showing here the quake cranes and the vessel cranes. But then you also have rich stackers. You have the energy racks to plug in the reefer containers. You have the AGVs going around the, the port. You have physical manual trucks being driven within the ports. Uh, you have, uh, well, this is, a, this is a matrix of connectivity between the services that we have. That means uh, since this is a hub port, you have operations that come from one ship to another. So this is a level of communication that those ships, uh, those services have to be have to be given. Okay, 
the port of Cartagena only manages 30% of the cargo goes inside the country. 70% of the cargo comes to the port, it's unloaded at the, port, at the port, and then it goes back to another ship because it's a hub port. So it's a hub and spokes model, basically. So to not burden you, unless if you want, if you want, you can, we can talk together. Uh, I can show you uh, the mathematical equations uh, later at the end, because otherwise we don't have time to explain the whole thing. Uh, the mathematical model shows an objective function of the integrated model prioritizing cost of transfer and the cost of penalties for non-compliance with service time windows. So uh, with the following set of constraints, you have constraints on resource assignments. You have constraints, uh, Resource assignment means you have to constrain the, the use of docs, doc segments, which we call is called berths, uh, crane and mobile cranes, rich tuckers, and other equipment at the board. You have to coordinate the period of time. So in our IoT-based information system, a big deal is how we manage events. And events is anything that changes the system. So to manage events, you actually have to do a lot of coordination for time. Uh, so there's a set of equations that we build that al and allow us and tells us to be able to uh, coordinate uh, the occurrence of every event to what happens uh, with the equations and the parameters in the equations. A big deal with that is because we're event driven. You have to deal with something called multiple events happening at the same time. So if something in the rare event that there are multiple events happening at the same instant of time, you need to be able to handle that. Otherwise, your system will miss one event. And I don't know if you uh, have dealt with this. If you use simulation, that's one deal, one big deal in simulation as well. So if you use it in information systems, which are highly interconnected with IoT sensory information, this is a highly important deal because if two events happen at the same time and you miss one, then you might not schedule correctly or appropriately the operations in the board. The, third, the, the fourth one is the planning horizon. So it defines the planning horizon required to develop the operating plan. And the planning horizon depends on whether the container is going to be unloaded, is going to be stored, is going to be allowed to enter the country, or is going to go back to a, not a, further, a forward connection. Yard inventories. It models the behavior of inventories and their relationship within the capacity in yards for each terminal. Movements. This block of equations and constraints ensure that the program movements correspond to the planned movements. And terminals and services. When I talk about services, I talk about shipping frequency line services. This block of equations determines the number of units, container vehicles transferred between terminals according to the service terminal assignment made by the model. Just to give you an explanation of how this is understood in terms of uh, birth scheduling, you have to check for every possible location of the ship at the uh, docks. And then there are some locations of the ships which are non feasible because they're used at the same time or because they go outside the time window. And if you go outside the time window, this has to be penalized. And actually, just uh, as an example, an hour after the time window for a port as busy as the port of LA would be of a cost of 75 to $80,000 in penalties from the port to the shipping line. So that's very important to not allow to happen. Okay. Our solution is based on information on an information system. So we actually wanted to take advantage of optimization methods for parallel massive optimization problems. Uh, and do something that we call decoupling the problem. That is, uh, we use uh, vendors methodology, vendors uh, uh, partitioning to be able to handle sub problems within the optimization model and then parallelize the optimization model of each subsystem, which was also connected. So every output from our subsystem was input for another one. That's what we use there. To solve the partition problem, we use, uh, we use two alternatives. The third issue here is how to implement it in an information system. We use a math heuristic coordination, which was a critical type of uh, handling that. Um, we use exact mathematical modeling based on vendors partition theory and modify to solve the integers for problems. Remember, vendors is continuous. The original partitioning of, uh, for vendors works in continuous uh, problems. 
so when you have integer, and most likely in our problem, combinatorial optimization problems, you have to uh, kind of uh, constrain the way uh, you optimize uh, the submodels in this case. And this is what you would look like at the end. Like this is what the port managers would look at. This is how they understand it. So you schedule it on a Gantt chart, simply, right? Now, what's behind that? There's a lot of modeling. And what's on it from the optimization perspective is that you're going to find a lot of ones and zeros. This is the assignment or the allocation problem services to terminals. So that means this is the typical uh, allocation that they were given. And this is the allocation that the model was able to find for that specific case at that specific amount of time. So you can see, uh, I, I, and you can see on the right hand side that when we ran the models, and by the way, we took different optimization solvers to run the different problems that uh, we wanted to. Um, the one that gave us always gave us a solution was CPEX. So we tried CPEX, we always express on CBC. And we wanted a stopping criteria. So until this problem, uh, CPLEX was giving us best solutions than any other. I mean, here I was able, this is the basic tuning model. So I found no, no problem here, not any of the solvers. But when I ran the real life problem, then we had a winner at the time. We had CPLEX performing better. Okay. Uh, and my stopping criteria was 18,000 uh, time units. Uh, so there were over 3 million iterations for CPLEX, over 7 million iterations for Kurobi, and over 64 million iterations for CDC at the time. When I say gap is that if you have run these solvers, you will know that the solver will give you a best bound and it will give you the best solution found. So the gap would be the difference between the best solution found and the best and the, and the bound that, were, that the solver gives you. That's what we find here. So this is 10%, 23% outside the gap. Now, is 10% okay? Remember, we're not force tracing here. We're solving a real core problem. So for real life solutions, you need to give solutions in real time somehow. So what we're doing here is being off uh, or doing the optimization based on a stopping criteria, which is accepted by the board to make decisions. When we went to a bigger problem, then only CPLEX was able to give us a solution at that time with the same criteria. I can get solutions with all of them. The problem is how many iterations I have to give to each one of the solvers and how I do parameterize, uh, how do I customize the different fine tuning parameters on each solver? That's not the most important. So if, uh, if your modeling people is more acquainted with GAMS and how to manage uh, the parameters for CIPLEX, it will most likely give you a better solution using CIPLEX. So this solution is highly dependent on who is modeling. Okay. Just because the way you program the code in each one of these uh, solvers is dependent on the capabilities of the person that is doing the modeling as well. So it might very well be that for other people, this might be different. I mean, for other codes, it might be different. So for Given some kind of a uh, common ground, uh, uh, common ground uh, capabilities, uh, we were able to test for four different commercial solvers the same problems, and we were able to find that one of those solvers were giving us consistently better answers uh, at that time. So, from the managerial point of view, how do you sell this? Okay. The challenge was to implement tactical planning and scheduling models. Now, we all know that tactical planning models run in the midterm and that operational models run in the short term. Yes, we know that, but how do we hit that? How do we put that to work? So the other part of it was to optimize operations and commercial services. The solution that we built was to implement a set of optimization models for the definition of operations timetables. That is, like you assign the rooms on a university uh, on a university setup. How do you schedule the use of the rooms? Same here. How do you schedule the use of birds, the use of cranes, the use of uh, all the resources? And how do you synchronize their use uh, with each other? The allocation of ships to docks and cranes to ship. 
to optimize the management of shipping services in the two terminals of the port of Japan. Okay. And the result is that we have now mathematical models that allows us to optimize operations of port four, planning the terminal services assignment. This is a practical planning problem. Planning events in the port, which are specific things that come, like a cruise that was not uh, a regular line. We do have, like for instance, it was interesting for me to know that San Diego has a cruise season, which starts in October. Why not in the summer? I mean, I, it was kind of a weird for me. Then I learned that that's the way they are organized because they're same vessels going the summer to the Atlantic. So they have a scheduling problem and a planning problem uh, in place for their operations. Uh, so planning events in the port, it means that sometimes you have a, how do you say it? I got that in English. Uh, uh, sail ship competitions that they do, regattas in Spanish is called regattas. I don't remember the name in English exactly. So that's an event uh, that happens in the port, a specific event. Okay. So if you want to schedule that event, you don't want to mess with the operations that the port needs to do. So you need to work that in advance. Okay. And that's money for that. And third, for analyzing new commercial opportunities. So when you have spaces to sell, remember, this is a hub operation. So that means that services are looking for that port because it's highly productive for one side. And second, because it's close to the Panama Canal, which is extremely important in shipping. And third, because it's, uh, uh, it's efficient. So if I download and I hop my operations at that port, which is the most efficient uh, in the Americas, I will gain more speed of operations for my shipping services. So if the port is able to find spaces to promise, available to promise spaces of time to allocate new services that come on a regular time, then for them, that's a commercial opportunity. That's a revenue management type of problem, okay? So anything that I have said until now, would not be able to do if I don't have a glue that automates the process. In our case, uh, is the information system that we have. Uh, this is a uh, uh, this is a fully deployed commercial optimization system, like you will find in GAMS or in Ample or in any of them. And it's it has the benefits that it's an intertwined ML large scale optimization system, and it's been running quite good for some time. So I use that same system to build the mathematical framework uh, to do that. Yeah, those were the two parts of the, say the research works. Uh, one of them, the optimization problem is targeted for transportation science. Uh, the second one is, is targeted for transportation research part D, uh, which is the one that handles environmental issues. Uh, and the second one was already submitted. So the ports emissions problem was submitted. The ports optim sorry, the first one was submitted. The ports optimization problem is still be submitted. Now, what we what do we want to do from here? I don't know if you know this, but we recently submitted a grant proposal to NSF uh, to the AxelNet uh, Office of International Exchange uh, uh, things. It's called AxelNet, and uh, what we're creating here is a network of. Uh, global research in ports optimization, ports operations, smart digital ports. That's the main goal. So yes, we do have in the US a small network created in which UC is part of it. Uh, and we're expecting, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed that that uh, grant is, a, is approved. But we do have people in the West Coast, in the East Coast, and we have a port in the Great Lakes. We have a colleague at Sony in Buffalo that wanted to be part of it. So this is something that we're creating the, uh, at the moment. We do have people in Colombia and Chile, and we are expanding to Brazil. Universal Sao Paulo is now joining the network. And we have the main node of this network is in uh, Germany at the University of Hamburg. And you know it's good to have them aboard, uh, in, or that them, they have us aboard, on board, because they are uh, leading the way in this research uh, in time. So uh, let me go. This is the main goal of the project. And I'm telling you this because most likely we will be looking for students uh, as soon as next year. 
So uh, we are willing to uh, convene this network to collaboratively build a unified knowledge framework on uh, the concept of smart ports. That means that we will be increasing the mathematical libraries, the mathematical optimization libraries, the machine learning libraries on this framework to be able to study the same concepts in different governance models. That is, the ports on the West Coast have a different governance model than the ports in, the, in Latin America, than the ports in Europe, than the ports in Asia, than the ports in Oceania, okay? Yeah. And these are the three specific goals that we have there, okay? Uh, to develop a highly interconnected knowledge-based state-of-the-art research and tools to share among the networks, users, to widen the spectrum of research in smart digital ports and to enhance the international collaboration of research in this area. So with this, I'm going to end my talk. And if anyone wants to talk to me about the mathematical modeling specifically, I'm open to it. So if you want to do that, uh, it will take a lot more. It has, the paper has 77 equations. So it would be better for us to meet aside this. this. So now, I was asked by NRE to talk about how we deal this with policy. Uh, I'm not a policy guy, <laughs> but I think that if we can make, uh, if we can talk to regulatory agencies and try to implement prediction of emissions instead of measuring the emissions, we can work better, okay? If we can do this implemented to all sorts of like economic uh, sites from the line transportation, from urban, uh, regulations. Uh, if you can, you know, get connected and send information to a brain that actually is able to understand what's the level of the real true level of emission, not the estimated. What we do nowadays is we go after six years to test our cars. And then we test them exactly after the maintenance schedule to get it fully fine tuned. So it's not really a true representation of the emissions that will happen in the following year, okay? A true representation would be if we are able to measure on real time or estimate on real time the usage. If we can do that, I know we can do it in the port. So if we can do that in transportation traffic, it would be perfect. Okay, so from the policy standpoint, I think that we can push regulations to, uh, or at least research on how regulations could be sent on this side of it. Now, we need to force ports to be efficient because efficiency in ports are also related to better handling of emissions. If you are efficient, you have the port operating better, then you don't have vessels waiting for you to be attended or served for a longer period of time. So the more efficient you become, the faster you serve the, the ships, the vessels. Yes, the faster you can make new business, of course, but that's the problem of the port terminals. The problem for, for us in the environmental part of it is that you are able to allow the ports to serve faster, then the ships will leave faster and the emissions of that vessel will not be there any longer. So this could be, or this should be pushed in policy as well. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, how exactly do they handle the issue now? Like, how do in the port of LA, for example, like, how do they, if they, if they're, you know, in the situation, for example, we had, well, it's ago, good, like, good that you ask, ask about LA. I, yeah. I started collaborating with the ports of LA and Tampa, Tampa and Florida. Uh, I started collaborating with LA uh, in California. And um, the way they handle it now is they have a task force. That task force keeps tracks of emissions. Keeps tracks means the emissions already happened. So they report. And the way they are doing the changes is they're changing to electrical equipment. They're changing, you know, they're asking, they're giving incentives to the carriers that use electrical equipment. That's how they handle it from the management part, part of it but they are not being, they're not predicting right now. That's the, the reason why they want me doing this with them is because they're not doing it. So, and it, it seems they like it. They like uh, that you can predict this and that's the trend in Europe. And Europe always marks the trend in ports uh, management. So, so they're the, they wanna do it. Now, the only thing they do now is just register and monitor. 
So, but you need the existing data to, in order to train the. I do need the data to train. Yeah, you need of the course. data to train yeah. anyway. So but the good the thing is that I, oh, I forgot to mention that. I was running class on that part. So where do I get the data from? If you see this image here, this one will give you a good idea. So if you see this image here, the data, you will get it from freight dropping systems. You will get it from vessel automated identification systems. And you will get it from port equipment. This is the only one that you can call in the port. These two actually have to be connected. The good thing about it is that the AI assistant now are, every port has it and you can rent it. You can buy it. And what is the AIS? System? AIS is the automated the vessel automated identification system. So it gives you everything from location to uh, the motor, the use of fuel, acceleration, all the variables that you saw that are in the table that I gave you. All oh, sorry, all these set of variables, you will find them from the AIS. These are variables that come from the vessel side, and you can just buy a commercial AIS system like Spire or like marine trends and you can you can follow the data because every vessel has to, to to you know is connected to that okay so that that's easy that's that's an easy part of it the data from the trucks is the truck the tricky one because you need connectivity and the only thing that you now can do is through a freight brokering system you can automate the collection of the data from the obd2 of the the computers of the of the trucks through an obd2 uh, kind of a uh, model uh, and you can do that in real time too. Well, let's not call it real time. Every five minutes you can get, otherwise it's too expensive. Okay. The information from the port is from there. Uh, I mean, they have the sensors, they're, they're measuring the pollution because they are mandated to. Uh, they actually have to put stations inside the city to see how they are affecting the city. So they're mandated to do that. So that, that information is, is supposed to be public. We were discuss, discussing about that. The, the port authorities are public to you. So the ports of state uh, kind of regulated. So yes, the information is public, but in order for you to get direct data from their information system, then you need to talk to them. And that's where I am doing a lot of work with the Port of LA now, because if that's where it takes. They, they sent me to work with WAPTEC. WAPTEC is their port system, their, their port community systems provider. That's the technology. Uh, so, so I'm working with the port, but through WAPTEC. So we're getting data on real time. Cool. Thank you. Great. Like six questions. The last one. No, no worries. Uh, you can call me later. <laughs> on, on refueling, uh, what percentage of the operations do you think? Uh, Bunkering, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how much time, demand, and pollution uh, could you allocate to refueling? Type of fuel. Interesting. Does it vary? Uh, it's not on the terminal models. So you have to allocate a, a specific sub model for that as well, which we didn't. Uh, so that was a must be done. Those people that come here. So there are three things of why shipping lines choose Cartagena. One is because they have the only shipyard around that is able to do maintenance to large vessels that come through the Canal of Panama, the Panama Canal. The second is because they are very productive, and then going to Cartagena will mean that they have enough, uh, you know, opportunities to be on time to the next port. And the third one is because there all, there's also bunkering there. The bunkering activities are not handled by the port. It's a different terminal, so I'm not controlling them. I, I, I didn't optimize it. If you want to do that, then you have to get, you have to include the sub model for the bunkering part of it to uh, the operational model. Uh, but we didn't do that. So, but thank you. That's interesting. I, I might think about it. Thank you. Uh, so, one of your slides, you were showing uh, the objective function, well, not actually function, but the kind of the results of uh, your optimization in terms of what, like how the different uh, types of optimizations gave you different results in the uh, objective function. I'm just curious how the actual operations compared to this kind of best case objective, objective function result, um, like in kind of how much improvement so, you might expect between what you're telling the ports to do and what they're actually doing. Right I now. have that very close, so I can tell you right now. So this is the same graphic that I showed you before. 
the, the, the allocation. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not showing it there. I'm not sure why. Um, which one? Oh, it's the uh, word of the difference. But uh, you just have to add your speech. So. Okay, thank you. So this was the same image that I showed you for the allocation of services. This was before initial allocation. This was the initial allocation. This was the allocation uh, uh, after. This is just to tell you what it means to do the optimization. Uh, so this this was this basically was to convince the port that first of all we were replicating the results, and second of all we were able to do better just by showing them step by step how how it works. So just to give you a uh, the change, just to give you a heads up, if you go from this point to that point, the change implies an increase of $35,000 that represents about 25% of the transfer cost. Just talking about transfer cost because this is two terminals. So if you move the cargo from one, if you leave the cargo at one terminal and you have to move it to the other terminal so that another ship picks it up and takes it to the next location, then that's what one movement will mean. One, only one. So that's 25% of the total transfer cost with just one movement, badly made. That's the economic significance of what it means to do optimization in ports. Okay. $35,000 for one bad move. Okay. It's a lot of money. As I told you, one hour of non operations in a port is millions of dollars. Okay. So if you gain one hour of operation, you're earning million dollars, millions of dollars. What kind of neural network are you using in your model? What, what? what kind of neural network? Yours? Neural network? Yes. Uh, is it well, deep or is it a shallow one? No, it, we're not using deep networks at the moment, So, which is part of the future research that we want to implement. Uh, we're using highly correlated and connected models, but not uh, not the models. So, so um, we're not doing RL within the network, oh. if that was your question. Yes. Yeah, so no, we're not. We're, we're just using plain uh, artificial neural network models with back propagation uh, strategies to uh, try to learn the equations. Uh, so we're still trying. Oh, so, so it has one hidden layer, yes. It does have one in layer okay. at the moment. Yeah. So you have how many nodes you say? It was uh, 200 and plus oh. of the initial nodes. So you just multiply that, that times two. For the inner layer and then the number of outputs were like 10 to 15 oh. so it, it was manageable at the time so but if you want to be more precise it, we do want to go into the deep neural networks to learn what happens there and we want to give the network the ability to self-learn so okay. so that 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 is able now it's just uh, we're, we're we can do that so uh, but yeah uh, the interesting part of it is how we connect the network to yes. the optimization model yeah. that's interesting uh, itself because uh to, in order for us to be able to, I mean, it's easy to get a result from the network into the emissions and then put it as a constraint in the optimization model. Yes. But when you allow the model to self-evolve and to control itself mm -hmm. to, you know, hey, something, there's, there's this kind of events that I've not seen before. These are the suggestions that I give you into a modeling equation, pick one. And yes. then maybe it's none of them, but maybe they will give you an answer on, as to how to build a new equation. Wow. So that happens all the time. Is it a dynamic prediction? It is. Oh, it is dynamic. Yeah. So you use the output of your optimization as a training procedure for the neural network? I do use the output. Uh, it's a cycle, by the way. Yes. You use the output of the neural network to constrain the model. Yes. But then you use the model to optimize, and based on the solution, you feed it, feed it back so that you learn, again, uh, the new value. Okay. Thank you. Interesting question. It's, uh, uh, yeah. So again, on the optimization, um, can you explain the gap? You yeah, the gap you is choose the CPL. Yes, and how do you measure better answers? Yeah, uh, okay. The better answers is the ones that you get after so many iterations. I mean, you have to give a stopping criteria. In our case, uh, the stopping criteria was the time that they need to do decisions. So we run that to eighteen time, eighteen thousand units of time, uh, which is eighteen thousand clocks of the computer at the time. Uh, so, but uh, the first part of your question is, what's the gap? The gap is actually given by the solver. And what we use is uh, the solver calculates 
a best bow that it, it thinks that it can reach because of the bounding methods that it, that it does. That best bound is not always achievable. So the gap that we're reporting is the gap between the best bound possible, uh, of the best bound uh, given by the solver with the best solution that I was able to find at 18,000 times uh, clocks. That was the gap that we were reporting in there. So it's not a gap between the, because these are real data, this is not a uh, previous instances. So the, this data changes, it's dynamic in time. You have a different type set of data every day. Uh, so we're just comparing the best bound that the solver can report you with the best answer that you were able to find with the same solver with the, and then you, you match them uh, all together. So that's, that's what we did. So what is a simulation? Mm. You're, you're no, no, not really. Or Optimizing. No, we're optimizing, so it's optimization. Uh, but one, the best answer is the answer that you run within the optimization problem until the stopping criteria is reached. Uh -huh. the, the best bound is actually a mathematical calculation that the software, the solver does with the set of data that you have and the equations that you have. And the constraints. Yeah, this, exactly. See, so yeah, the equations that constraint. So whichever is smaller, it's what you consider the best answer. So. No. Oh, it's because it's not, it's not powerful. Sure. So let, let me just put it in. Now, uh, let me go back a little bit. So you have the data. It changes day by day. You have uh, your model is already set. The number of the, the amount of time that you're going to run that model is set. 18,000 clockwise uh, clock uh, ticks. In 18,000 clocks, you are able to report an answer from the different solvers that we use. That is what we call the best answer at that time. The constraint is 18,000 unit, time units. The solver is also able to give you a, an answer called best bound. So that's not from our side. That's something that's the, the solver, either Gurovi or Cyclics. They calculate itself uh, based on uh, the mathematical equations, the restrictions, the constraints that you have uh, in the models, and based on the data that you have of that. And that one is not time bound. It's not time bound. That's yeah. how you. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, the smaller difference will give you the, the better answer. The better yeah. answer exactly. the time frame. And sometimes it's the only answer. I mean, when we ran the larger models, we were only able to find answers with sequence, not with the other three. Imagine the the best bound to be the truth. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you don't know the truth. Uh, no, no, no. The imaginable truth, because you don't know if you can reach yeah. it. Um, right? You don't know if it's feasible, you know. yeah. that would be the, the, exactly. the ideal. Exactly. And whatever is closer in the time frame you have, that's exactly. what you call the best answer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, I can run this indefinitely. And then most likely, I will get the answers from all of them. And most of them will be very close to each other. But then the efficiency on the yeah. use of solvers is which one gives you the better, the better answer in the least amount of time, because you're doing this for commercial. Thing. If that's in, in, in our case. And so you want to give them a service, they might hire you again for a different problem yeah. or, event or network. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's dynamic. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's your horizon for the optimization? For example, the you mean the planning period yes. for each run? Yeah. Uh, the tactical problem runs every 13 weeks, the, the, the scheduling problem runs, runs daily. Okay. Yeah. Um, is it possible to use a uh, recurrent neural network instead of the SQL network? Because yeah. Yeah. you are uh, optimizing a single port, yes? And yeah, yeah, different terminals of a single port. Different yeah. terminals. So why, why are not using uh, STM network or recurrent network? Oh no, you can use them. Okay. Uh, we didn't at the time. Okay. So it's just a choice uh, that we made at the time. Because again, at the beginning of the problem, this was a solution to a company. So I need to actually do this in three months. <laughs> so that's, that was the time that we did this. Uh, now it has taken me more time to write the paper than to run the solution. And that's, 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 that's true, this is how it works. Now, uh, to answer your question better, um, you can investigate with the same amount of data, with the same type of data. You can use any kind of configuration. You can, as I told you, we, we try random forest regressors. Uh, we, we tried decision tree regression. We tried neural networks. We tried uh, auto TPOF, auto ML TPOF. We tried uh, nonlinear. Okay. 
multiple regression standard. Uh, and we, we just found the best one was with Diplo, but, uh, but, uh, but then that's not a real truth. We need to keep searching. With the same data, you can do a lot of things. Final question. Let me get closer. I'm not 20 anymore, so I need to get closer to here. Uh, by the way, I did the routing a lot. Uh, so, so that was my initial uh, software solution that I sell, uh, that I sold when I was in Colombia was the routing. So, so yes, you can do that in last mile, first mile. I was hired lately to do more first mile in agri businesses than last mile in distribution. First mile has different problems. Uh, I, I learned that California does a lot of first mile uh, solutions too. So, because uh, there's a lot of agriculture here. So, so yes, I, you can transfer, uh, I mean, the mathematical framework is universal. The mathematical model is in particular for the ports, but you can do mathematical modeling for any, any problem. And, and nowadays, I mean, uh, 20 years ago, I used ant colony systems to optimize combinatorial problems. Nowadays, I just run optimization, mathematical optimization. I don't do, uh, I mean, I do learning, uh, I do reinforcement learning, and, and ANS is a type of uh, reinforcement learning, uh, but I don't use them to optimize anymore. I use them to learn. And then I optimize using mathematical parallel massive uh, uh, frameworks to optimization. Because they give you optimal, sort of uh, optimal values. In, in, and now the time is, it used to be a problem, time of solution, 20 years ago. It's no longer a problem. Yeah. Optimization, mathematical, pure mathematical optimization, no longer has the problem of dimensionality that we used to have before. So, especially because we, we are now massively doing this in parallel. So you break the problems into small sub problems and then you solve them uh, in parallel and then you connect them back together. You feed it, it's a feed forward type of a problem. And, and then you get solutions in really uh, reasonable amounts of time. Okay. okay, thank you so much.